Okay, excellent. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about this important topic of disability etiquette and inclusion and talk about why access matters. I'm so excited to be here with all of you um, over Zoom. Again, my name is Tess Stanton and I am the training administrator at the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. And I'll tell you a little bit more about who we are and what we do in just a moment here. But if you've been to one of these sessions before, you know that we always have to get started with this disclaimer that information, materials, and or technical assistance are intended solely as informal guidance and are neither determination of your legal rights or responsibilities under the ADA nor binding on any agency with enforcement responsibility under the ADA and the Rocky Mountain ADA Center operated by the University of Northern Colorado is funded under a grant from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research to provide technical assistance, training, and materials to Colorado, Utah, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming on the Americans with Disabilities Act. So just a bunch of fancy words to say that um, we're not lawyers at the, at the ADA centers. We do not give legal advice, but rather we give information, education, informal guidance, training, you name it, on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And as promised, just a little bit more about who we are and what we do. Um, I won't go too much in depth because if you've attended these sessions before, you already know about the Rocky Mountain ADA Center, but I always wanna make sure I include this just in case we have any new folks joining us and could use the ADA Centers as a resource. So the Rocky Mountain ADA Center, where I'm coming from, is part of the ADA National Network. And what the ADA National Network is, is it's a collection of centers throughout the United States that provide information, materials, technical assistance, training, and informal guidance on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And really the biggest service that we provide is that technical assistance service, TA. And that's where if you have a question about the Americans with Disabilities Act, or maybe you're in a situation where you think the Americans with Disabilities Act may apply, but you're not really sure, or you're not really sure what the ADA says um, and what, what your requirements are, or maybe what your rights are under the Americans with Disabilities Act, you can call the Rocky Mountain ADA Center or your local ADA Center and be connected with an information specialist. So the phone number for the ADA National Network is 1-800-949-4232. And if you call that number, it's kind of like a um, like the bat phone. If you, if you call that number, you'll be routed to your respective local ADA Center based on the area code of the phone number that you're calling from. So if you're within Region 8, which is Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana, you'll be routed to the Rocky Mountain ADA Center where, where I work um, because that is our region. Um, but rest assured, if you're outside of our region or if you know someone who is outside of our Region 8 and they are within the United States, they will also have a local ADA Center who are doing such great things. And you can also submit inquiries online, which many folks decide to, to go that route um, if, if it's easier to explain your situation in writing or you just want to have a paper trail or maybe it's just more convenient or accessible for you to connect with someone um, online. You can do that as well. So the website for the National ADA Center, or I'm sorry, for the um, ADA National Network is www.adata.org. And so you can go to that website, that's kind of the umbrella website, and you can find the website of your local ADA Center through that kind of, um, you know, more overarching website. So you'll find the Rocky Mountain ADA Center's website there. You'll find, you know, the Northeast ADA Center, the Mid-Atlantic Pacific ADA Center, the list goes on and on and on, but that's where you can you can find us online. And so again, technical assistance, that's, that's probably our most utilized service. It's just really convenient if you're in a situation where you're not sure what your rights and responsibilities are under the ADA and you just need to connect with a, a human about it. Um, we have that technical assistance since it's free, it's confidential, so you can rest assured that if, you know, you give us a call or you submit an inquiry online, we're not going to come knocking on your door the next day because we're not an enforcement agency. So we don't enforce the ADA, we just educate on it. But there are enforcement agencies that do, um, you know, take that step of enforcing the ADA. And if you need to connect with those agencies, you know, predominantly the Department of Justice and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or if you need to the, the instructions for filing a complaint under the ADA, that's something that we can refer you and network you to contacts within our networks. Or if it's a question that is out of our scope, um, we have contacts 
many, many contacts um, in the disability space and otherwise to to refer you to. So even if we're not answer able to answer your question, we'll we'll get you to someone who can. We conduct research, we provide training, we publish and share materials. So on top of these live sessions, um, we also have free online courses that you can access anywhere at any time from RockyMountainADA.org. And we have a social media presence as well. So we're always posting on Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, um, we even have a Pinterest, so you can keep up with us and follow along or connect with us on there as well. But really the 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 big takeaway from this slide is just that the ADA centers are throughout the country and they're there to assist you. If you have a question or a situation that um, you, you know, you need to kind of work through with an, an ADA information specialist, we're here, here to provide that support. So now jumping into today's topics, um, our learning objectives are kind of, you know, what you're going to walk away with today. And so we're going to discuss the prevalence of disability and why access matters. We're going to understand etiquette fundamentals such as proper language when addressing people with disabilities and interaction considerations. We're going to discuss best practices for being inclusive of people with disabilities. And as always, I want to make sure that this learning is as driven by you as possible. And so I just want to echo what Tiernan said, if you have a question, please feel free to drop that into the chat box. I have the chat open. Um, and then also you can unmute yourself if you're more comfortable doing that as well. Um, I may ask some questions throughout the, the training just to kind of, uh, you know, put your knowledge to the test. Um, don't worry, there's no grade. But if I do that, you know, feel free to use the chat box or unmute yourself however you're most comfortable. And if at any point you're not able to hear me, see me, you're not able to, you know, see my slides full screen, or I do have a couple videos. If you're not able to hear the sound of those, um, please just let me know because sometimes I don't always, always catch that on my end. And um, as always, you know that these slides will be distributed, so so you don't have to write everything down. You can have them as a resource, and this session's also being recorded, so you can refer back to it that way as well. And so these next few slides um, may be review from, from the previous sessions, but I wanted to include them just to reiterate the prevalence of disability and why access matters. And it has been a bit since we've gone over these ADA definitions and the prevalence of disability. So um, I think it's important to, to include in this session. The ADA defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And this includes people who have a record of such an impairment, even if they don't currently have a disability. So that may be someone who had cancer and the cancer is now in remission. And it also includes individuals who do not have a disability, but are regarded as having a disability, like someone who may no longer be limited by injuries but sustains scars or, or sustains the physical appearance that could um, make them be perceived as having a disability. So in other words, they're not limited by their disability, but they're limited by the perceptions of others. And the ADA also has prohibitions that um, prohibit discrimination uh, based on, you know, someone's association with, with a person with a known disability. So the ADA does not just apply to people who have immediate disabilities. It also applies to those who may be discriminated against based on their record of having a disability, those who could be discriminated against based on being regarded as having a disability, and those who could be discriminated against for having an association with a person with a disability. So between the definition of disability and the inclusion of those with a record of a disability and the inclusion of those who are regarded as having a disability, this is called a three-pronged definition. So, you know, there's three prongs. There's folks with disabilities, folks who are regarded as having a disability, and folks who have a record of having a disability, and they all have protections under the ADA. But it's important to note that this is not an and definition, it is an or definition. So in other words, you don't have to meet all three prongs to be considered a qualified person with a disability under the ADA. You can just meet one prong and be considered a qualified person with a disability. 
And it's also important to note that under the ADA, there is no exhaustive list of what conditions qualify as a disability and, and what conditions don't. So the ADA does not say you are a person with a disability if you are a wheelchair user, if you have diabetes, or if you have dyslexia. That type of list does not exist under the ADA, but rather you you just meet this definition of having a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And you know you could be considered a qualified person with a disability under the ADA. And the reason for that is because everyone experiences disability differently. Many disabilities are non-apparent. Um, some people don't have names for their disabilities. Doctors may not have names for you know certain disabilities. Uh, counselors may not have names for certain disabilities, but that does not mean that those folks don't have disabilities and those disabilities aren't um, valid and that someone couldn't be discriminated against for having a condition that, that qualifies as a disability that doesn't have a specific name or label. And just to, to really hit home with the prevalence of disability. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention report that 26% of adults in the United States have a disability, which is about 61 million Americans. You can think of that as about one in four people in the United States are people with disabilities. And then to break these numbers down, 13.7% have serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs, 10.8% have serious cognition difficulties, 5.9% of adults are deaf or have serious difficulty hearing, and 4.6% are blind or have serious difficulty seeing. So this is a really, really large amount of our population. It's safe to assume that on the day-to-day, -day, you are interacting with people with disabilities, whether or not you know it. Maybe you yourself are a person with a disability or someone very close to you is a person with a disability because there are so many people in the United States and elsewhere who have disabilities. And when we're thinking about these numbers, you know, they're, they're staggering. These are staggering statistics. Disability is the largest minority group in the country and the world. And reports will differ um, based on what source you're you're, you're looking at and what surveys are used, but typically reports of disability in America report about 20 to 25 or 26 percent of adults in the United States have disability, but it's also important to remember that many of these reports don't account for um, younger people, children with disabilities, and also reported disability numbers are likely lower than reality because someone may not report their identity as disabled. Maybe it conflicts with another one of their identities, maybe they're underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed, or they are hesitant to report themselves as disabled because of the fear and the stigma and the stereotypes that are so often attached to, to disability. And that's why we engage in this kind of education, because disability knowledge and etiquette are forms of attitudinal barrier removal, you know, installing a ramp or, um, you know, emergency preparedness, which we will talk about next month. Um, while those are all forms of barrier removal, this kind of social knowledge is also barrier removal for people with disabilities, because oftentimes the, the biggest barriers that people face on the day to day are the attitudes and perceptions and stereotypes placed upon them by others. And also, it's important to remember that disability can be viewed as a product of an inaccessible world, not individuals' limitations. So instead of expecting people with disabilities to adapt to an inaccessible world, we should instead adapt our, our world to the humans living in it so that it is more accessible for people with disabilities and everyone. And Something else that, that's important to remember, even if you're not directly affected by disability currently, it's safe to assume that at some point in your life you will be. Disability is a very unique identity because it's one that you can acquire at any time. You know, we know that accidents happen, especially in the work you do. Um, we know that that uh, that disabilities are often acquired through aging. And so that is why disability is just should be considered a very natural part of human life is because um, it's it's safe to assume that it, that if you are not already a person with a disability, you you may be one at some point. Again, uh, further further solidifying the importance of this kind of education and and the the knowledge of um, disability and its prevalence and the social considerations that should come with it. Yeah. <laughs>
And the ADA does not specifically require that we act kind and considerate towards others. But as I mentioned before, people's attitudes can be one of the largest barriers for people with disabilities. And historically, society has tended to isolate and segregate individuals with disabilities. And despite there being, you know, many improvements, such forms of discrimination against individuals with disabilities do continue to be a serious and very pervasive social problem. So the purpose of the ADA is to assure equality of opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency for such individuals. And then on top of those efforts, it's important, again, to engage in this kind of attitudinal knowledge to um, break down the, those discriminatory stereotypes and, and social stigmas around disability to ensure that the, the world is more inclusive and accessible and, um, and considerate of everyone. So with that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to dive into disability etiquette. And a good starting point when talking about disability etiquette is the idea that people with disabilities do not want to be seen as heroic by default because they live with disabilities. So here I have a quote from Stella Young, who was a comedian, advocate, and writer. And she says, I want to live in a world where we don't have such low expectations of disabled people that we are congratulated for getting out of bed and remembering our own names in the morning. I want to live in a world where we value genuine achievement for disabled people. And this idea that Stella Young is talking about um, are, are these media depictions and other depictions that portray people with disabilities as inherently inspirational and courageous. And these depictions are actually quite harmful. This is referred to as inspiration porn in the disability community because it objectifies people with disabilities for the entertainment of non-disabled audiences. And we see this often in news stories about people with disabilities who have overcome it or succeeded despite it. And sometimes Sometimes inspiration porn is also intended for non-disabled people to look at and think, well, my life isn't so bad in comparison to theirs. And these depictions are harmful because they simplify the lives of people with disabilities and treat disability as something that's indisputably bad. They can also communicate low expectations of people with disabilities or set unrealistic standards for people with disabilities. So just as equal treatment involves not treating with people with disabilities as inferior, it can feel, you know, equally patronizing or uncomfortable if non-disabled people overcompensate and automatically put people with disabilities on pedestals. And now I have a TED Talk from Stella Young. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop my video so that we have a bit more bandwidth. Um, and I'll share this video. And if you're having any trouble hearing the sound, please let me know. And I also want to note, too, that these videos are linked in the slides. I grew up in a very small country town in Victoria. I uh, had a very normal, low-key kind of upbringing. Uh, you know, I went to school, I hung out with my friends, I fought with my younger sisters. It's all very normal. And when I was 15, a member of my local community approached my parents and wanted to nominate me for a Community Achievement Award. And my parents said, mm, that's really nice, but there's kind of one glaring problem with that. She hasn't actually achieved anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they were right, you know. I went to school, I got good marks, I had a very low-key after-school job in my mum's hairdressing salon, and I spent a lot of time watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Dawson's Creek. Yeah. I know, what a contradiction. <laughs> but they were right, you know, I wasn't doing anything that was out of the ordinary at all. Um, I wasn't doing anything that could be considered an achievement if you took disability out of the equation. Years later, I was on my second teaching round in a Melbourne high school, and I was about 20 minutes into a year 11 legal studies class uh, when this boy put up his hand and said, hey, miss, when are you going to start doing your speech? And I said, what speech? You know, I'd been talking to them about defamation law for a good 20 minutes. And uh, he said, you know, like your motivational speaking. You know, when people in wheelchairs come to school, they usually say, like, 
inspirational stuff. Uh, it's usually in the big hall. And that's when it dawned on me. This kid had only ever experienced disabled people as objects of inspiration. We are not, you know, to this kid, and it's not his fault. I mean, that's true for many of us. You know, for lots of us, disabled people are not our teachers or our doctors or our manicurists. We're not real people. We are there to inspire. Um, and in fact, you know, I'm sitting on this stage, looking like I do, in this wheelchair, and you are probably kind of expecting me to inspire you, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you dramatically. I'm not here to inspire you. I'm here to tell you that we have been lied to about disability. Yeah, we've been sold the lie that disability is a bad thing. Capital B, capital T. It's a bad thing. And to live with disability makes you exceptional. It's not a bad thing and it doesn't make you exceptional. And in the past few years, we've been able to propagate this lie even further via social media. You know, you may have seen images like this one, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. Mm. Or this one, your excuse is invalid, indeed. Or this one, before you quit, try. Yeah. These are just a couple of examples, but there are a lot of these images out there. You know, you might have seen the one, the little girl with no hands, drawing a picture with a pencil held in her mouth. Uh, you might have seen a child running on carbon fibre prosthetic legs. Um, and these images, you know, there are lots of them out there. They are what we call inspiration porn. <laughs> and I use the term porn deliberately because it, they objectify one group of people for the benefit of another group of people. So in this case, we're objectifying disabled people for the benefit of non-disabled people. The purpose of these images is to inspire you, to motivate you, so that we can look at them and think, well, however bad my life is, it could be worse. I could be that person. But what if you are that person? I've lost count of the number of times that I've been approached by strangers wanting to tell me that they think I'm brave or inspirational. And this was long before my work had any kind of public profile. They were just kind of congratulating me for managing to get up in the morning and remember my own name. <laughs> and it, it is objectifying. These images, these images objectify disabled people for the benefit of non-disabled people. You know, they are there so that you can look at them and think that things aren't so bad for you, to put your worries into perspective. And life as a disabled person is actually somewhat difficult. We do overcome some things. But the things that we're overcoming are not the things that you think they are. They are not things to do with our bodies. Uh, I use the term disabled people quite deliberately because I subscribe to what's called the social model of disability, which tells us that we are more disabled by our bodies, by our, the society that we live in rather, than by our bodies and our diagnoses. So I have, uh, I've lived in this body a long time. I'm quite fond of it. It, it, uh, it does the things that I need it to do and I've learnt, I've learnt to use it to the best of its capacity, just as you have. And that's the thing about those kids in those pictures as well. They're not doing anything out of the ordinary. They are just using their bodies to the best of their capacity. So is it really fair to objectify them in the way that we do, to share those images? Uh, people mean, people, when they say, you know, you're an inspiration, they mean it as a compliment. They mean it as a compliment. And I know why it happens. It's because of the lie. It's because we've been sold this lie that disability makes you exceptional. And it honestly doesn't. And I know what you're thinking. You know, I'm up here bagging out inspiration. You're thinking, geez, Stella, aren't you inspired sometimes by some things? And the thing is, I am. I learn from other disabled people all the time. I'm learning 
Not that I am luckier than them, though. I am learning that it's a genius idea to use a pair of barbecue tongs to pick up things that you drop. <laughs> I'm learning that nifty trick where you can charge your mobile phone battery from your chair battery. <laughs> genius. We are learning from each other strength and endurance, not against our bodies and our diagnoses, but against a world that exceptionalizes and objectifies us. I really think that this lie that we've been sold about disability is the greatest injustice. Um, it, is, it, makes life, it makes life hard for us. Um, the, and that quote, the only disability in life is a bad attitude, the reason that that's bullshit <laughs> is because it's just not true. Because of the social model of disability, you know, no amount of smiling at a flight of stairs has ever made it turn into a rap. Never. You know, smiling at a television screen isn't going to make closed captions appear for people who are deaf. You know, no amount of standing in the middle of a bookshop and radiating a positive attitude is going to turn all those books into braille. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Um, I really want to live in a world where disability is not the exception but the norm. I want to live in a world where a 15-year-old girl sitting in her bedroom watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer isn't referred to as achieving anything because she's doing it sitting down. I want to live in a world where we don't have such low expectations of disabled people that we are congratulated for getting out of bed and remembering our own names in the morning. I want to live in a world where we value genuine achievement for disabled people. And I want to live in a world where a kid in year 11 in a Melbourne high school is not one bit surprised that his new teacher is a wheelchair user. Disability doesn't make you exceptional, but questioning what you think you know about it does. Thank you. All right. So um, I, I think that Stella Young just says it so well. So I always like to include that video, which, like I said, that is linked in the slides if you wanted to share it far and wide. So if, if we're if we're not treating people with disabilities as, you know, inherently inspirational and heroic, how then should we treat people with disabilities? So next we're going to get into just some general um, kind of golden rules when it comes to disability etiquette. So the number one rule when it comes to disability etiquette or just general treatment of people is to consider people and treat people as individuals first. Disability is just one aspect of someone's identity among many other components such as familiar role, race, occupation, association, etc. So listen and learn from people with disabilities. They may voice how they want to be treated or if it feels appropriate you can ask them respectfully. Everyone experiences disability differently. Everyone kind of regards their disability differently. So just as is the nature of the ADA, there's no one size fits all treatment method and everyone's individual preferences should be respected accordingly and, and kind of um, regarded as the, the etiquette fundamentals for treatment of that individual person. But remember that etiquette is considering someone's individuality. And later we'll talk about the, the best um, you know, disability language, but, but best practice is really just to refer to people by their names, by their, their names first. You know? However, on the following slides, I will give you some tips for general best etiquette practices for specific disabilities if you're not in a situation where you're able to really you know, understand what someone's individual preferences are. And these tips are synthesized from guidance from people within the disability communities that are represented as well as people who work very closely um, with, with folks in the disability community and that have been reviewed um, as well as sourced from, from those people as well. So again, that's people with disabilities and um, people who work very closely, such as the Utah School for the Deaf and the Blind, um, the Colorado Commission for the Deaf, Hard of Hearing, and Deaf, Blind, and um, healthcare providers, many others. 
So disability etiquette really at its core is just a matter of basic respect. So treat adults with disabilities as adults, just as you would any other adult. And same thing for children. It's essential to remember not to infantilize people with disabilities. So in other words, you know, avoid treating people with disabilities or talking to people with disabilities as younger than their actual age, even if the intention is just to be exceptionally kind and courteous to them. And with that being said, feedback I've also received on this training topic from various members of disability communities is that people with disabilities also don't want you to be so scared of messing up in your interactions with them that you avoid interacting with them all together, but instead interact with them using the same courtesy as you would anyone else, but also remain open if they express individual preferences that could heighten you know, your respect based on their specific identity as disabled. And you may be thinking, if disability etiquette is just a matter of basic respect, why is this training not ending now? You know, I know how to respect others. Respect is a basic principle. And shouldn't those principles apply across the board? Well, yes, that's true. But this training could be helpful for two reasons. And one of them is that we might often treat people with disabilities differently or as others without even knowing it. And the scenarios, words, and actions to avoid that I'll outline in the following specific slides are based on real life scenarios that people with disabilities experience often. And while basic respect is a universal principle, considering everyone's individualized identities is still necessary to acknowledge, you know, in acknowledging that we're respecting disability and not ignoring it. So while disability doesn't always wholly define someone, it plays a very important role in who people are, which is why it deserves these specific con courtesy considerations. So just to summarize, people with disabilities don't need to be or want to be tiptoed around, but it's important to, to keep the following tips in mind just to ensure that you are being respectful um, because sometimes we, we think we're doing the most respectful thing, we think we're doing the most helpful thing, but it may not always be the case. And here I have another video just uh, demonstrating some of these, these uh, common courtesy um, blunders, I, I suppose you could call them. Good morning, Bob. Good morning there. Big man. Morning, Alice! There's no need to be awkward. Poor Bob. Like so many of us, he just doesn't know how to interact with people with disabilities. It's pretty easy, really. People with disabilities are people first. We need the same things that every person needs, like respect. Good morning, everyone. Attention! Uh, okay. Maybe we need to be more specific. The easiest way to show respect is to focus on the person, not the disability. It's okay. You'll get the hang of it. One easy way to focus on the person is to watch the person signing and not their interpreter. Or their companion. It's really cool that you'd like to help, but do us both a favor and please ask me first. What you think might be helping? I got you. Wait, wait, ah! Oh no, might actually not. If you'd like to offer me help, let me hold on to your elbow. Don't take mine. Hey, would you like to take my arm? Sure. Assistive devices help us to live our lives. They're really important and really personal. Grabbing them only makes it weird for everyone. What? Please only touch our devices and service animals if we've given you permission. And don't take it personally if I ask you not to. Remember that my service animal helps me all the time. Neither of us would like it if we were separated. Remember, we make our own decisions. We sign documents, vote, volunteer, work, and pay taxes. We get married. So don't address me just because I have a great smile. Just because I'm blind... May I help you? ...does not mean I'm deaf. Just because I'm deaf 
doesn't mean I'm blind. And just because I use a wheelchair doesn't mean that I can't sweep you off your feet. So take a deep breath. Relax. We don't bite. Unless we're really hungry. Hello, ladies. How are you? Hello. And if you're not sure what to do, just ask. Hi. Would you still like to see a menu? Uh, no, thanks. But can you please read it to me? Sure, definitely. Just treat us the way you would want to be treated, and we'll all be okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Alice. Right. Awkward no more. Nice job, Bob. Go forth and be human. All right. So now that we've kind of covered the golden rules of disability etiquette, we're going to dive into some more specific disability etiquette tips to consider. And um, these may be, you know, things that you saw in the video and, and um, additional tips as well. So if we're talking about folks who have mobility or physical disabilities, um, it's best, you know, if someone's a wheelchair user to be seated or stand back a few feet just to achieve that comfortable eye contact if possible. Yes, you can say want to go for a walk, but always ask before assisting because like we saw in the video, if someone was using, um, you know, a, a door for support um, you know, you wouldn't want to interfere with that. And also ask before touching or moving mobility devices. You know, mobility devices should be seen as an extension of someone's self. And so just as you wouldn't touch a person, um, you wouldn't, you know, touch touch someone's mobility device the same. And also, you know, you want to avoid touching mobility devices without asking because um, if someone had their hand placement uh, in, a, in a certain position and, and wasn't expecting someone to touch their mobility device, such as their wheelchair or their walker or their crutches or cane um, that could that could be very hazardous so always just ask before before doing so consider the accessibility of meeting locations and keep accessible restroom stalls vacant if you have that option to do not say wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair or handicapped as the word handicap has some historical connotations um, and then wheelchair bound and confined to a wheelchair some some folks don't see themselves as bound to their wheelchair or confined to their wheelchair but rather they see it as the way that they they move about the world and so that's why language such as wheelchair use or a person with a mobility or physical disability may be preferred. And then I have a, a video kind of demonstrating more on this. We will we'll go ahead and skip this just for the sake of time, but it is linked in the slides. And then for folks who are blind or have low vision or other visual disabilities, um, avoid assumptions and stereotypes that all people who are blind use Braille or are totally blind or use a cane. This in many cases is true, but not always. Um, and so someone could be blind, but not read Braille or not use a cane, but it doesn't mean that they, they aren't blind. Um, it's helpful to get the person's attention and speak directly to them. Identify yourself and announce when leaving. Offering to read written information, such as like we saw in the video where the, the server offered to read the menu can be helpful. Always ask before acting as a sighted guide. And if your help is accepted, offer your arm instead of grabbing theirs and provide verbal cues. And do not walk on the same side as a service animal if they're using a service animal. It's best to give non-visual directions. So instead of saying, you know, turn right at the yellow wall, instead saying walk forward five feet and then turn right. Keep walkways clear of obstructions. Yes, you can say see you later, but instead of saying visually impaired, you may say blind or low vision. The word impairment or impaired is very commonly used in disability communities. It's the word used by the ADA, and it's one that you'll hear used quite a bit. But there are some folks who prefer not to be called impaired because they don't don't see their identity as an impairment. Um, rather, they just see it as their identity. And so because of that, uh, you may you may hear that some people um, don't refer to themselves or others as impaired. And for folks who are deaf, hard of hearing, or have hearing disabilities, um, you can ask how they would prefer to communicate. Some people prefer to communicate through lip reading. Um, some people, you know, communicate verbally. Some people communicate through sign language. Um, so it just depends. So before making that assumption, it's always best to ask. Speak directly to the person, not their interpreter. So if someone's accompanied by a sign language interpreter, look at the person who's signing while they're signing and, and look at them even if the interpreter is acting kind of as the 
the um, the audible voice um, because that's the person you're communicating with, not the interpreter. Speak at a normal volume unless asked otherwise. Repeat what you've said if needed rather than moving moving on. Make sure the person can see your face if they're reading your lips. So um, particularly in emergency situations that might require wearing a clear mask. Lightly touch or wave to get the person's attention. Remember that there is no universal sign language. Also, American Sign Language is not a one-to-one -one ratio with spoken English, so it's its own distinct language, and not all people who are deaf sign. And again, remembering that that deaf culture is, is a common language, shared values, beliefs, norms, and behaviors, and many people who identify with deaf culture don't refer to their... Um, you know, being deaf as an impairment or don't refer to themselves as mute, but rather would call themselves deaf or hard of hearing. And for people who have speech disabilities, it's important to give the person your full attention and allow them to finish their sentences. This is one of those things where it can feel helpful to finish someone's sentences for them, but it's best just to give people space to communicate in a way that feels best and most comfortable to them. If you didn't understand what a person has said, ask them to repeat it rather than just kind of smiling and moving on. Or you can repeat what you heard for verification. If the communication still isn't coming through, you know, suggesting moving to a quieter environment or suggesting alterna alternative methods of communication, such as, you know, would this be better over email or text, um, can also be helpful. And next, talking about um, little people. So avoiding assumptions that all little people are childlike or cute or can't have children is important because those are just that, they're assumptions. They're largely untrue. Respect personal space and don't crouch or kneel for a little person, as, as many little people have said, this can feel rather infantilizing. A little person may or may not identify as having a disability um, and always ask permission before helping to reach things. And instead of using the word midget, um, instead using little person, person with dwarfism or person of short stature is oftentimes prefer little person or little people is the term that I hear most often um, by this community and to, to refer to this community. And here I have a quote from Sinead Burke, who is a writer, activist, fashion influencer, and Iris presidential advisor, who says, the word midget is a slur. It evolved from P.T. Barnum's era of circuses and freak shows. Society has evolved. So should our vocabulary. Language is a powerful tool. It does not just name our society. It shapes it. And then talking about folks who have cognitive, developmental, or intellectual disabilities, um, this may be, you know, disabilities ranging from dyslexia, you know, learning disabilities, um, Down syndrome, autism, always speak to people age appropriately and speak directly to the person, not their companion. And don't, you know, automatically assume that non-disabled friends and companions are, are personal care assistants because oftentimes they're friends or companions. Be prepared to present information in alternative formats according to learning style. This is helpful for all learners. Speak clearly and concisely and allow time to process. Do not insist on eye contact, but don't be surprised by it either. And respect self-soothing strategies such as stimming and understand that environments can be overstimulating. And instead of, you know, using describers such as crazy, insane, lunatic, hysterical, or lower high functioning, saying person with a specific disability or neurodivergent is a, a term that I hear often used. As always, those terms are, are subject to individual preference, um, but but neurodiverse, neuro, neurodivergent, um, and, and, you know, just naming the disability are going to be preferred than, than um, labels that, that carry kind of negative connotations. And here I have a quote from Ethan Lissy, or Lisi, I've never actually heard the pronunciation um, audibly, but, but he is a TED speaker and says, do you know that some people are trying to find a cure for autism? That's because they see it as a negative thing, as a disease. Many people are challenging the idea, and to us, we think autism is not a disease. It's just another way of thinking and looking at the world. Our brains function differently from most people's brains. If autism was seen as part of a natural human spectrum, then the world could be designed to work better for autistic people. So that goes back to the, the idea earlier of, um, you know, people with disabilities not seeing that as a disease or even an impairment in all cases. 
And next, talking about non-apparent disabilities. So it's very, very crucial to remember that most people with disabilities have disabilities that are not immediately obvious. These are often called non-apparent disabilities or hidden disabilities or invisible disabilities. So remember that all kinds of disabilities, all types of disabilities can be non-apparent. You could have a non-apparent physical disability. Many, uh, Most mental disabilities are non-apparent and more. And so always believe that someone's stated conditions and limitations are real even if you can't see them. Follow the person's lead and assume that more people have disabilities than you think, which is why it's of even greater importance to avoid those ableist statements because um, you know you you may be talking to someone who has a disability and you may not know it. And then finally, just to touch on service animal users. So the ADA definition of service animal are dogs and miniature horses that are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. So if someone has a service animal with them, speak directly to the handler, not the animal. Avoid petting animals unless given permission. Allow service animals to focus on their work <clears throat> by not distracting them. Inform the handler if the animal approaches you and assume service animals live full and happy lives. Understand that sleeping animals are not off duty and, and then also just treating handlers with common courtesy. And now I have a question that we'll go ahead and use the chat function for. Which of the following are needed for a service animal to be granted public access under the ADA? Registration, proof of disability, harness or vest, certification, paperwork, identification cards, patches, documents from doctor or slash and proof of training. What do we think? Let's see here, I have the chat opened. Don't know if any is coming through, so I'll go ahead and reveal the answer. Um, none. So no proof, uh, registration, harness, or vest um, are required. There's, there's no required documentation or equipment for service animals under the ADA, and they have no legal bearing under the ADA. The use of them could create access issues for people with disabilities because it creates the expectation with the public that these are required. And sometimes equipment may also interfere with a service animal's work. So this is important to know because not all service animals will wear gear. So if you see someone in public and, or you see, you know, who's assisted by an animal, even if it doesn't look like they're a service animal, you can assume that they are a service animal and, you know, avoid petting them or distracting them because not all service animals wear vests. Now, it's not to say that that equipment can't be helpful because it certainly is. Um, I know if I had a service dog, I would want it to wear a vest. It's just to say that it's not required under the ADA. So you may see someone, you know, come into a public place with, with a dog that doesn't have a service service animal vest on and say it's a service animal and it, it most certainly could be um, as long as it meets that definition, as long as it's a dog or miniature horse that's individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of people with disabilities, then that's considered a service animal under the ADA. And again, you know, there's no um, ADA registration for service animals. There's no ADA ID card for service animals. So, so if someone claims that you have to flash your service animal ADA ID, just know that such a thing um, does not exist officially. And there may be times where, you know, let's say your, your entity does not allow pets in for good reason. And someone comes in with a dog and you're not sure if it's a service animal or if it's a pet. There are only two questions you can ask when someone's need for a service animal is not obvious. The first question is, is this a service animal required because of a disability? And the second question is, what work or task has the animal been trained to perform? Because as we know, it's the work and task that dogs or miniature horses are trained to perform that differentiates them from pets or emotional support animals. Um, because where emotional support animals aren't usually trained to do any kind a specific work. They're just comforting by their presence. Service animals, on the other hand, are actually trained to do some kind of um, active tasks, such as 
retrieving medication or alerting someone when they're about to have a seizure. And again, it's not to say emotional support animals aren't beneficial. It's also not to say that you can't decide to allow emotional support animals or pets into your facilities because you certainly can. Um, it's just to say that they're not recognized under the ADA. So any questions so far before we um, just get into our last bit on, on disability language? And I'll also say if you're interested in learning more about um, service animals in the ADA, because we just kind of scratched the surface here, we do have multiple online courses on that topic as well, or you can give us a call. All right, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I'll continue monitoring. So earlier I mentioned avoiding ableist language. So what are some examples of ableist language and what are some better alternatives? Let's go ahead and break it down. So it's important to be mindful of your message as well as individual words. And here are some specific types of language that can be harmful along with some examples of these types of language. So unsolicited medical advice, which can be harmful, would, would, you know, examples of that are, my friend swears by these vitamins to help him focus, or have you tried yoga? Recovery as the only option. So an example of that is, I'm praying they'll find a cure for you soon. Casting doubt on credibility can be very harmful. So examples of that would be saying, well, everybody feels sick sometimes, or they're way too pretty to have Down syndrome, or math is just hard. He doesn't have dyscalculia. Or accusations of faking. So examples are, wow, you don't really look like you're disabled, or you should leave these spaces for people who really need accessible parking. Policing language, so saying, I wish you'd stop calling yourself disabled, and also non-disabled flippant language, so using disabilities as self-describers if you may not identify as having that disability, so saying, you know, I'm so OCD about that, or I just had a dyslexic moment could feel minimizing to people who have those disabilities. And when it comes to language, there's there's these ideas of person-first language and identity-first language. And most people have been taught to use person-first language, and that's where you describe someone as a person first, then specify a disability. So examples of this are person with a disability, person with autism person who is blind, person who is deaf. And the intention behind person-first language is to place the person first so the disability is no longer the primary defining characteristic of an individual, but rather one of several aspects of a whole person. And this is certainly better than referring to someone as that ADHD kid or as disabled people as the disabled. However, some people feel that the emphasis on personhood despite a disability only contributes to the stigma surrounding disabilities. And the thought is that we don't feel the need to use person-first language to refer to other aspects of a person. So for example, we don't refer to someone as a person with blondness or a person with tallness or a person of use. So although person-first language is often considered a, the most neutral way to discuss people with disabilities, it may not always be the favored choice. And the alternative to person-first language is identity-first language. So examples of identity-first language are saying disabled person, autistic person, blind person, or deaf person. And in the, in the autism community, for example, identity-first language is widely preferred because they understand autism as an inherent important part of their identity. And so as with other matters of etiquette, the best course of action is going to vary person to person, uh, depending on individual preference. So rather than just assuming, ask or listen for what, you know, the kind of the language structure someone prefers. I will say person first language is often used as kind of the default model in speaking and writing, but just know that oftentimes these models of language are used interchangeably, or one may be preferred over the other. And here are two quotes advocating for the use of each type of language to kind of give more insight into why one may be preferred over the other. So person first language says, uh, the quote here says, people first language puts the person before the illness or medical condition and describes what a person has, not who a person is. Using a diagnosis as a defining characteristic reflects prejudice and also robs the person of the opportunity to define him or herself. And person first language, especially in this context, um, may be preferred 
especially when it comes to medical diagnoses, such as you wouldn't say, you know, a cancerous person, but rather you'd say a person with cancer. But then advocating for identity first language, um, the quote here says, autistic is another marker of identity. It's not inherently good, nor is it inherently bad. I'm autistic. I'm also East Asian, Chinese, U.S. American, a person of faith, leftist, and gender queer. And when we're talking about dis people with disabilities, here are some terms that are either offensive or outdated that, you know, you really should try to avoid. So offensive disability terminology includes invalid, mongoloid, defective, crippled, handicapped, retarded, imbecile, moron, idiot, gimp, demented, spaz, deformed, impaired, midget, and mute. And these words have been used to marginalize other, belittle, and oppress people with disabilities. And then we have outdated disability terminology, which may not be used with um, ill intent, but but can can be considered euphemisms among the disability community and kind of erase disability from the picture. So these terms being mentally challenged, differently abled, special needs, varied ability, afflicted with, insane, psycho, deaf and dumb, suffers from, vegetable. And while these, you know, many of these terms were considered once medical or neutral, these terms have have evolved to be used to marginalize other and belittle people with disabilities um, or, you know, these terms have been used historically to relegate, insult, or discriminate against people with disabilities. And again, terms like differently abled, special needs, and varied ability are usually used with good intentions, or maybe they're even taught to be used. However, these terms are usually, usually developed by non-disabled people to emphasize strength and counteract ne negative associations with disabilities. And people in the disability community have come forth and said that these terms can feel patronizing to people with disabilities and are largely considered euphemisms in disability culture. And these euphemisms reinforce discomfort with disabilities and reinforce the implication that disability is a negative and undesirable and indisputably bad state. So instead of, you know, differently abled, you could say people with disabilities, or instead of, you know, people with special needs, you may hear people with disabilities, or instead of using the words handicapped parking or restrooms, you could instead say accessible parking in restrooms. And here I have a quote as well as a linked article from Dr. Anjali Forber Pratt, who is a Paralympian and the director of the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. And she says, disability is not a dirty word. These words such as differently abled, special needs, handicapable, actually diminish and erase disability from the picture. Having a disability is not something to be ashamed of, and such euphemisms deny the existence of disability and reinforce the stigma surrounding disability rather than embracing it as a valued aspect of diversity. And you may be thinking, well, at one point in my life, I was told to use the term differently abled, or I was told to use the term special needs rather than disability. And again, it's all going to be uh, subject to, to individual preference. But just know if you're if you're um, someone who's thinking, you know, what gives I, I, I've been told to use these words, and now I'm told not to, you've maybe taken a ride on the euphemism treadmill. So euphemisms are natural neutral, vague, mild, or indirect expressions to refer to something unpleasant, embarrassing, or taboo, such as sex, death, bodily functions, and disability. And the euphemism treadmill is language evolution from neutral to offensive. So we do acknowledge that language is always changing. Um, language is always falling in and out of acceptance. And as the language changes, you know, we want to make sure that that we're respecting that. And even the the information that's taught in, in this very training may fall in and out of acceptance. So just to acknowledge that, but also to acknowledge that disability is a word that does have power. It's the word that's used by the ADA. And so when someone claims disability, they're, they're accessing their rights. Um, and also acknowledging that people don't want the word disability to be erased from vocabulary, but rather brought to the forefront to be acknowledged as a valued aspect of diversity, as Dr. Anjali Forber Pratt so eloquently says. So, um, and then it looks like I, I, I'm looking at the chat. Someone asked, what about using the term those with special abilities? Um, so special abilities probably would be um, 
you know, considered in, in that euphemism category, such as special needs or varied ability. Again, it's, it's going to depend on the person because many people uh, may prefer a specific label that does differ from disability, um, or it may depend on the context as well. And so again, always, always want to give that disclaimer that disability etiquette, the, the fundamental is respecting everyone's individual preferences. But when it comes to um, disability as a whole, more and more, we're seeing that word disability used because there is power in, in the word um, disability. And so just to kind of end us out with, with our, our big best overarching practices, listen, treat people as people, avoid assumptions and ask before helping. And with that, I'll go ahead and put up our training calendar. So this is our third training. Um, the, the previous two, which there are recordings available for, were ADA overview and basic legal obligations, accessible communication in the ADA. And then today we talked about disability etiquette and inclusion, and why access matters. Next month on May 17th, we'll be talking about emergency preparedness in the ADA, which I'm very excited for and maybe especially applicable in the work that you do on the day to day. But in the meantime, if you would like to reach out to us and get in touch, um, please feel free to do so. Again, my name is Tess Stanton. Our office email is email at rockymountainada.org. Our website is rockymountainada.org. Or if you want to get in touch with your local ADA center, if you're outside of our region, you can call 1-800-949-4232 or go on to that umbrella website, which is adata.org. Our center is open 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. And um, with that, I will go ahead and open the floor to any questions that we may have. But um, if you know if you're if you're logging off, I want to thank you again for for your time today, for your attention. I really appreciate everyone's attendance. And um, let's see here. I we all I also see a comment in the chat that says a lot of spaces are now not allowing service animals because they feel people have taken a lot of liberties with this. How do we support the disabled in this realm? So again, service animals is a topic that uh, is very nuanced. If, if a, if a entity is covered by the ADA, so if it falls under the ADA, in other words, if it's a, a state and local government facility, or if it's a place of public accommodation, so basically a a private business that serves the public, it's it's generally going to be covered under the ADA. And because of that, it's going to be required that you allow access to service animals in those places. Now, there are certain behavioral expectations of um, service animals that are clearly uh, prescribed by the ADA, those being that service animals have to be under the control of their handler and they have to be, they have to meet behavioral expectations. So they should be housebroken. Um, so not going to the bathroom on the floor and again, under the control of their handler. So not, not lunging, not excessively barking at uh, other people, not jumping up on other people. Um, so under that control. So in those cases, if, if someone comes in and claims that they have a service animal, but but the service animal is not under the control of the handler or it's not housebroken, that could be a, a way, a reason where, um, you know, you could ask someone to remove their service animal because it's not meeting those behavioral expectations set forth by the ADA. But if, you know, the case is that someone brings in an animal and it is meeting those behavioral expectations, it, it meets the definition of a service animal under the ADA, you ask those two questions, and, and the handler provided you credible verbal assurance, then you want to be providing access to service animals. Good question. Any other questions? <laughs>